Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Nahmaduhu ala ma affaq lahu min al-ta'a. Wa la da'anuhu min al-ma'asiyah. Wa nas'aluhu limannatihi tamaman wa bihablihi a'tisama. ثم الصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنام خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين محمد وعلى آله الطاهرين وصحبه المنتجبين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد عجل فرجه We praise to Allah the Lord of here and the hereafter We praise him for the help that we receive from him in carrying out our duties and the help that we receive from him to refrain from disobedience. We ask him to complete his favor and make us hold on to his rope. We greet our Holy Prophet the most noble of all prophets and his pure progenies. Sisters and brothers, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to the 10th night of our program, the Muharram 2020 program from Islamic Center of America. عظم الله جورنا وجوركم بمصاب الحسين وأهل بيته عليهم السلام السلام عليك يا أبو عبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليك مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر العهد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين عن عقيلة بني هاشم زينب الكبرى عليه الصلاة والسلام إنها قالت إن كنت تعمل بما أمرناك وتنتهي عما زجرناك منه فأنت من شيعتنا وإلا فلا If you follow what أهل البيت have commanded you to do and refrain from what they have forbidden you to do then you are a true follower of أهل البيت If not, then not We start as usual with the recap uh, briefly of what we discussed last night. Last night I tried to take you back to the night of Ashura, 61 after Hijran, when Ahlul Bayt asked for a slight delay that night and the to be given another opportunity or to be given the opportunity to spend the night submitting to Allah, praying and getting closer. Ashura, I explained, is a unique historical event that not only when it comes to the interpretation we use different lenses, as certainly because it represents or brings together two tif different types of human beings, understanding the character of each group would help us to define or at least find our own position vis-a-vis uh, -vis what group closer to us. People from different walks of life participated in Ashura. That's why I said if you are searching for role model, here is the one. 
because Ashura contains within it male as well as female, young and old, Arabs and non-Arabs, Muslims and non-Muslims, member of Ahlul Bayt and the one outside the family. That's why, because it's rich and all of these people made sure or contributed one way or another in forming and the development of uh, this event, that's why no matter what, where is our social location, we will be able to find something that uh, we can associate with or understand. A night such as last night, Ashab and the disciples of Imam Hussein sallallahu alayhi proved their loyalty not only to him and to his cause, but to Ahlul Bayt without shadow of a doubt. When he turned the light off and in the darkness of the night, he said, I have removed my bay'ah from you, you can go because Bani Umayya are after my head and you can save your, your life and, and move on. Although few people did that, but most of them remained steadfast. These were the one, but Quran calls them Nufusul Mutma'inna, pure, assured of themselves and righteous. When they ask, they really wanted to spend the time at night and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I uh, cited par partially part of the du'a makarim al-akhlaq from our Zain al-Abideen sallallahu alayhi wa in uh, Sahif al sajjadiyya in which he said, O oh Lord, Grant me longevity so long as my life is spent in absolute service to you and nobody else. But if, I, if you feel that my life has become a field, an open field, in which shaitan roams around, freely take it. These people clearly indicated that uh, the night of Ashura because of who they were, they really needed that extra step to be taken and to be close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. By this afternoon, the 10th of Muharram 61 after Hijrah, the beast had already achieved their goals and committed the most heinous of acts and the unthinkable happened. Just before the martyrdom of Imam Hussein, historians claim that Imam stood up and looked around, making sure that there was nothing else left to offer. And it was only for him the last piece to be offered for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At that moment, they say a meeting took place between him and uh, Sayyidatuna Zainab sallallahu in which Imam Hussein entrusted her with all the confidential information, secrets of Imama, so that she will keep it until when Imam Zain al Abidin will be able to pick it up from him. And this is a unique position. The only woman in the history of, uh, of Imama is given in or entrusted with the, uh, with the confidential information to become the transition and uh, someone that would take it and give it to another Imam. No, no other woman has been granted such uh, a privilege. I want to digress a little bit here. Unfortunately, if we look at the Muslim uh, community now, 
Although academically there is a huge abandon, uh, uh, we find abundant amount of literature regarding human rights, but particularly women's rights. And, but if we were to focus on the Muslim community, we can divide their attitude towards gender equality or non-equality, whatever we may call it, into three different groups. Number one, which defined as patriarchal, uh, the men dictate and women simply submissive, they have to carry order. Women here are restricted in the home, housebound, only a certain amount of space allowed for them for the chores. The, the, any participation outside the house for decision making or uh, deciding for themselves is not there. Somebody else decides for them as if they are qasr. They don't have that maturity, the intellectual maturity that they can do uh, for themselves. They can look after themselves. Now, on the other hand, this is one group of people, and we deal with it on a regular basis. Another group of people uh, that this is particularly with women, if you remember the concept of freedom, the non-intervention understanding of freedom, these are women within our own community that they have picked up that idea. It is my right, I can do whatever I want, nobody should uh, prevent me from doing in anything, and they so-called liberated themselves. That's number two. And we see them again coming to the center on, on a number of occasions. And in between the two ex uh, extreme, there is a third group that they understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran has granted them equality because Quran does not look at individuals within the gender uh, definition or designation. Islam, Quran looks at men, women, uh, men and women as one soul or two similar souls that before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they all are equal. If we cast a glance to the early history of Islam, we see that women participated in practically all aspects of one life. What is painful when it comes to these interpretation, all of these extremes, they rely on some kind of hadith to support their own argument. The one that is patriarchal, even within our own tradition, they say that there is a hadith from Fatima al Zahra that a woman should go to a husband's house with a white wedding dress and come out of the husband's house with a coffin, white coffin. In between, she has no right to do anything. Hence, you, shan, you cannot divorce them, you cannot, they cannot ask for divorce, even if they are, their rights are violated. When you try to argue and say it doesn't make sense, the hadith doesn't make sense, it's, it violates the fundamental principle of justice in Islam. It's not there. Somebody has narrated the hadith for them. So we go back to the, we cast an eye on the early history of Islam. We see that women participated in different things. They gave bay'ah to the, to the Holy Prophet. The way that he used to do it, to avoid direct touching, he would put a pot full of water. A, wo a sister or a woman will stand on the other side and put her hand in. And the Holy Prophet puts his hand on the other side and she swears allegiance to him and bay'at to him as the holy prophet and the leader of the community. So there, there was nothing to literally bar more than half or 55% uh, of the Muslim community from participating, not only in deciding their own destiny, in participating and working with everybody else uh, and, and con contributing to everything else. That's the problem. Khadija Salamullah when she married the Holy Prophet, she didn't abandon her business. She was a wealthy woman. Because of her business and business acumen, she continued with the business. 
She didn't just pack everything up because I'm married to the Holy. Well, at that time, the, uh, the Holy Prophet was not officially uh, at least commissioned to become the Prophet. Nearly 10 or 15 years before uh, the Holy Prophet was commanded to, to do so. But in the meantime, even after the Holy Prophet was commissioned, she still continued. The wealth that Muslim community were able to use during the years that they were in, in, in caves uh, and incarcerated and literally exiled from the community was from her, not from anybody else. And the Holy Prophet repeatedly said, I miss her because she stood by me when nobody else stood by me. And if it wasn't for her contribution uh, to the well-being of Islam, Islam would have been in a different position. Fatima Tazara didn't give up her, her right and responsibility within the community. Before, at the young age, he earned the title of Ummu Abiha because of her kindness and staying with, the, with her father, literally going with him like a shadow to protect him. Everybody, somebody, every time someone threw a, st a stone, Zahra accepted that stone so that it would not hurt her father. And when migration took place during the battle of at least Badr and Uhud, she participated as a nurse. So where does this idea come from that uh, somehow women have to be incarcerated in the house and not to be given the opportunity to educate themselves and to become an active member of the community? Unfortunately, this is the fundament. When you restrict, you create an image that this is Islam's image, then women see that as irrational, they begin searching an alternative modality, and it is the Western modality that they drop into. Western modality, yes, that gives them the freedom to go out and work in any form of dress that you want, non-interference. But what happened? Strips the spirituality away from them. That's the dichotomy that they have to, uh, to practice with. Islam came with a gender issue, uh, 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 came, when it comes to gender issue, came to empower women and give them equal rights as human beings because before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I mean, look at verses in the Holy Quran. As-sadiqeen was sadiqat was sa'imeen was sa'imat, and so on. Before Allah, gender has no meaning whatsoever. It's the soul. And soul is gender neutral. Gender is only to function in the relationship between uh, and in two individuals within, within life. Not before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why when it comes to gender equality, Islam brings both men and women, lowers them to what we call uh, equal level. And say now, we talked about this in the past, now you want to be a good person? Inna akramakum Allah atqakum. Elevate yourself, whether you are a man or a woman. The relationship the, the, the gender, male, female, is only to function as a relationship, relation issue within, within life. Now, falsif unfortunately, we talked about falsification of hadith and fabrication. One of the major themes that huge amount of falsification has taken place in it is this role of gender. And unfortunately, it has somehow seeped into even the interpretation of Quran. Rather than say the, the qualification or at least the criteria defined by Quran, and then I look at hadith to see whether the hadith it can be trusted or not. Remember a few nights ago we discussed this? The, the falsification took place by elevating these fab fabricated hadith to the level of scripture. Now, hadith is the same as Quran or sometimes even higher. Why? Because 
they might accuse you of not understanding a hadith, a Quran, but there is a hadith in this Bukhari or in that book or somebody else that clearly explains the, the, uh, the, the interprets the Quran. Karbala, on the other hand, is another topic that has been uh, uh, the casualty of falsification. Today, how many telephones came in? Is it okay to celebrate today? Because we associate with the other group too much? They say there is a hadith that Prophet Musa descended from uh, the, the, the Mount Sinai on the, everything good in the history of humanity has been brought, subhanAllah, has, has come in this day. And now we are being told because Musa was sick and relieved in this day. Isa had a pain, it was in this day. Uh, Nuh had a problem with his boat, it was in this day. Ibrahim had a, an issue, it was in this day. Why? Because the whole essence of the argument is to turn this day into a celebration. People will forget about the crime that was committed uh, on such a day. Yesterday, as I was le leaving the center, the telephone came in. Mulana, is it correct that we have a hadith that you can fast tomorrow and you can uh, wear somehow colorful clothes and so on and, and be happy? This is another casualty. No wonder when people say that if it wasn't for the sake of Zainab, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the issue of Karbala would have remained or buried in the sand of Ashura, never to be aired again. And the falsifiers would have made sure that this Karbala issue would not rise again. So Islam came to bring together this notion of, at this, this works for both genders, male or female, to remind every, every single one, man or woman, that first and foremost, all the values, all the criteria, all the designations of jahiliya, null and void, we start all over again. The only value is taqwa. Inna akramakum Allah atqakum. And remember, in Arabic literature, the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the word akramakum, which is in the masculine gender, covers both. When men and women are all present, the masculine gender is used, similar to French. In akramakum indallah atqakum, both male and female. There is no class, there is no gender, there is no color, there is no creed. The day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the judge. And if you want to elevate yourself, you have to think of Allah and stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not because I am a man, I am macho, and somebody else has to take order. How many divorces we have here because of this misunderstanding or misconception? Under what condition, what rationality gives a man the power to beat his wife up and then appeal to some obscure uh, hadith that interprets the verse? On the day of Ashura, nine o'clock in the morning, I receive a call. I want divorce now because I have been beaten up on the day of Ashura. We have lost our marble, our marbles. That's the patriarchal mindset. As soon as you say anything, wadrabuhunna. Subhanallah, they know nothing about Islam, but this verse they remember it. Karbala becomes the, the, the typical manifestation of this synthesis. Everyone, male and female, made, uh, participated in it and uh, worked. 
No one else, on, when the Amir, Imam Hussein sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi was moving out of Medina, the first question that everybody asked, why are you taking your family with you? They couldn't understand that the revolution of Imam Hussein requires two Hussein, a male and a female. Hussein, the male, does his part and departs. Hussein, the female, picks it up, picks the mantle up. Hussein and Zainab have to work together. No one understood the relationship between Zainab and Imam Hussein. If you go and look at our ahadir, they both equally worked to get this revolution up uh, off, off the ground. You needed somebody that has the same gene as Hussein, brought up under the same patronage as Hussein, educated and learned from the same school as Hussein. And if I may say so, hardened by the crisis and the tragedies of life, if not more than Hussein, equal to Hussein. There was nobody else but Zainab. Because she was the one that had to see the martyrdom of Imam Hussein. Imam Hussein didn't see the martyrdom of Zainab. Zainab, she was revolutionary like Hussein, patient like Hassan, spoke like Ali, and carried the dignity and the majesty of Zahra, and the blood of the Holy Prophet. She epitomizes and brings together everything, all the credential that is needed for somebody to pick up the mantle and move on. There were plenty of women uh, uh, in, in Karbala, and historians talk about them. From Ahlul Bayt, at least the, the daughters of Amir al Mumineen was uh, Zainab, Salam Kulthum, Fatima, Safiya, and so on, and a few others. Uh, Imam Hussein had two daughters, at least Fatima and Sakina. And there were wives and daughters of Muslim ibn Aqil, uh, mothers of other Sahabis that were killed and, and martyred during Ashura. But nobody could come close to the, to the role that Zainab played. It was only Zainab that after about three o'clock or four o'clock of a day like this, when everything settles, quiet and silence uh, takes over, Zainab comes to the Tal Tal Zainabi. Those of you who have gone to Karbala, a few years ago I was fortunate to go with uh, Hajj Zahra and a few others. Now they are repairing and fixing it. But Tal Zainabi, a small mall uh, that higher than around at that time, stood up, looked around, and saw her brother literally torn to pieces. Contrary to some of the, what speakers talk about beating the chest and tearing everything out. Allahumma taqabbal minna hadha al qurwa O Lord, accept this little bit of offering that we give. Can anybody else substitute here? It was Zainab that stands before Ibn Ziyad, looks down at him with contempt. And when he says, how did you find out what happened to your brothers? Ma ra'aytu illa khayra. I saw nothing but beauty and goodness. You needed somebody of the caliber of Zainab to go to, to Sham and turn the table on, on Yazid and savage him to the point that he suddenly got frightened that with this language, this kind of evidence, now people have realized what had happened to them in 40 years of misinformation, people are going to revolt, change the strategy and put the blame on Ibn Ziyad. In Sham at least, both Imam Zain al abidin and Zainab played the role here. But from what we have to understand, 
One Hussein fell, another Hussein stood up. This supports our argument. Remember when we were talking about Ghadir and the necessity of the leadership after the Holy Prophet. Revolution of Imam Hussein would not have succeeded if anybody else would have picked up the mantle but Zainab Sallallahu Why? Because very close in everything that one could imagine. Any inferior character would not have been able to deliver. So we go back to the point that I raised. We want role model. Here is the role model. Let's focus and take the message from them, take their message to heart. Now, hadith that I started uh, at the beginning is a hadith from Zainab Sallallahu Clearly defining a paradigm. The paradigm is not beating the chest. The paradigm is not tearing your clothes off and chain and everything else. The paradigm, as they say in the at least uh, theological language, rests on praxis, on action. Very simple. Zainab says, In kunta ta'amal bima amarnak, wa tantahi amma zajarnaka an, fa'anta min shi'atina, wa illa fala. Your action is going to save. I've been asking during the, 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 the nights that I have been uh, privileged to give the lecture to ask the same question. Let us step back and reflect. Where do we locate ourselves as far as character and how do we see our amal? We cannot claim that we are the Shia of Ahlul Bayt simply by paying lip service. Our action speaks louder than what we're claiming. Quran, there is a verse in Surah Al-Baqarah 134, These were the nations. They did their responsibility and their parts, and they will be questioned for what they have done and you will be questioned for what you have done. Are we ready when we say we are going to be questioned but what we have? Are we in the process of really understanding whether we are close? It's easy to claim Ahlul Bayt, yes. And there are some hadith that say man baka wa tabaka and so on. If our life doesn't reflect this basic command of being a Shia, Bakka and Tabaka, is not going to, to provide anything. We pass Ramadan and we come out, the same thing. We go to Hajj, we come back, back to the square, to, uh, to the same thing. Now, Ashura is the same thing. After the formal end, tomorrow or the day after, we are back to the normal. Well, this is the challenge. Ashura presents the picture that if we want really to take every piece out and learn from it, there is a possibility. Whether ethical, moral, religious, philosophical, political, economics, justice, injustice, they're all there. What we have to do is to think about Ashura of 61 after Hijrah is over. But the essence of Ashura is that eternal conflict between Haq and Batil. When there is a hadith, although some people debate whether it's valid or not, Kulla Ardan Karbala and Kulla Yawm in Ashura. Assuming that it is correct, but it reminds us that this eternal conflict is there. Every time, every period has its own Hussein and its own Yazid. Where do we locate ourselves vis-a-vis -vis that continuum? If we support injustice and we 
epitomize the, character, the negative character of these individuals, beasts, in whom kalanaam bal hum adal. Don't expect on the day of judgment to be called that we are the followers of Allah. But if, on the other hand, we really reflect and we begin to acquire some of the characteristics, I, I mentioned this a couple of nights ago, Marhum Mutari, Rahmatullah my own old professor, he used to say, if we succeed by the end of Ashura in picking one correct character, that's enough. We've done something. Otherwise, if not, then I can't say it's a waste of uh, experience, waste of time. At least you might have heard something. The rest is up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and up to us. Unfortunately, this is the last of our program tonight. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant every one of you the privilege of working hard and ultimately becoming the followers of Ahlul Bayt. And in the process, becoming the true human being. We are born as lookalike of humans with potentiality. How much time do we spend in our life becoming human, true human, that Allah was originally intended for us to be? Then that's the struggle, the jihad. Jihad al-Asqar and Jihad al-Akbar. May Allah bless you all. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.